Welcome to the city of Markham. My name is Ranji Vora and I'm the city architect. First of all, I'd like to recognize some of our counselors who have joined us for this uh, talk. Councillor Valerie Burke, Councillor Alan Ho, Councillor Colin Campbell. I'm sorry if I've missed anybody. I don't think so. Uh, I would also like to, we are honored to have our CAO Andy Taylor with us. And I would also like to recognize one of the co-sponsors of this program, Brenda Lebrez, the Commissioner of Community and Fire Services. Um, thank you, Brenda, for providing the money to arrange this event. Markham initiated a public realm strategy in 2014, which was championed by both Brenda Lebrez, uh, the Commissioner of Community and Fire Services, and co-sponsored by Jim Baird, the Commissioner of Development Services. Uh, the public realm strategy is basically set up to improve and raise awareness of the public realm. The public realm speaker series that brings us here today is part of that program and was started in 2015. This is the second lecture of the series. I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker from the David Suzuki Foundation. Dr. Faisal Mula is the Director General for Ontario and Canada's North at the Foundation. Dr. Mula has a PhD in ecology from Dalhousie University and has been working in and is interested in how principles of conservation biology uh, are applied to urban areas. But the main reason we like Dr. Faisal Mula is that he is one of us. He is a born and bred native son of Markham. So that's why we have him here. This webinar is also streaming online, and I believe we have somebody from Dubai listening in. Uh, welcome to that. Uh, this webinar will also be put on the foundations and the city's website, so you can access it later on if you need it. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Faisal Mullah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a little bit nervous because uh, it is my return back to my hometown of Markham. This is where I was born and where I grew up. I spent most of my childhood rambling across the fields, the farms and forests of Markham in places like the Rouge, which is going to become Canada's first urban national park. I'm so happy about that. And that's really a success of local residents who have fought for over 30 years to protect this very precious place. Um, I'm also a little bit nervous because I realize that I'm the only guy standing between you and your lunch outside. <laughs> so you'll have to bear with me. I'm going to speak for maybe a little bit around 40 or 45 minutes, and then there'll be an opportunity for uh, questions and answers as well. And if anyone is just absolutely famished, you can run out and grab something. Um, now, I realize that this audience is, a, is primarily a technical audience. There's very, very learned people in this room. There's policy experts here. There are uh, political leaders like our, our um, renowned counselors. And so you'll have to bear with me. I'm going to give primarily a conversation that is not technically in mind, but I am going to be a little bit provocative because I work for Canada's largest environmental group. And as the David Suzuki Foundation, we are a science-based advocacy organization, but we like to push uh, where we can. And we definitely feel that there are improvements that need to be made across this country when it comes to how we grow and manage our urban areas. I'm so honored to be beginning this conversation here in Markham because there's no question about it. Markham is a leader when it comes to sustainability. You just have to step outside of this building to see all of the examples of where sustainability is being integrated into how this community is being run. I am really honored to come back here because that is not the case in many other urban communities that were also going through a similar boom when I was growing up in the 1980s. I recently went through a very important milestone in my life. I didn't get married or have a baby or buy my first house. This important milestone was the fact that I paid off my student loan. It took me 25 years to pay off my student loan. 
and I am now debt free when it comes to my education. Definitely not debt free. I have mortgage, I have car payments, I have all the other things. I have young children who are incurring unbelievable amounts of expenses uh, every day. But when I had this meeting with my bank manager who passed across the table a piece of paper that said you no longer owe us $200 or $300 per month to pay off your student loans. I began to think about how we ascribe value to some things in our lives. We will give value to a fine education, which I've been blessed to have received. We'll give value to our properties, uh, our vehicles, to other things. But we oftentimes don't give value to those very things that, as David Suzuki reminds us, are literally the life support systems of our communities. Forests, fields, farms, estuaries, beaches, other types of natural and managed ecosystems that filter the air, that help regulate our drinking water, that provide habitat for wildlife, as well as recreational opportunities. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about this tagline. So several years ago, Canada's, one of Canada's largest financial, financial institutions began running one of the most popular uh, public relations campaigns in Canadian history. Does everyone know the bank behind this? This is uh, uh, Scotia Bank. Now, the first time I saw this tagline, I was a little bit pissed off. I mean, I thought it was a little bit bullish for a bank to be uh, claiming to all of us that we are richer than we think when you consider the fact that personal debt levels are absolutely outstanding. Uh, there is great uncertainty around the economy, uh, the manufacturing sector in particular. Uh, but nevertheless, the advertising folks that came up with this tagline are brilliant. They're totally right. We're loaded. But I would like to argue that our true value, the true wealth, is not found in our pocketbooks. It's not found in our city coffers. It's not found on the balance sheets on Bay Street. The true value in our communities are found in the natural assets that our towns and our cities are blessed with. Green space and farmland. These are assets that provide not just billions of dollars in market commodities, like agricultural goods that are sold around the world, but also billions in dollars in non-market ecological goods and services, over and above the wealth that we would typically ascribe to these things. As I said, these are the life support systems of our communities. Clean air, clean water, and healthy food to eat. Although we don't give it much thought, forests remove carbon from the atmosphere, sequestering and storing carbon in those big old trees and deep organic soil pools below the surface of the ground, and they thereby help us fight climate change. The global warming problem would be much, much worse if it wasn't for our forests and our wetlands and our grasslands, that vegetation that is helping to sequester and store and thereby act as a hedge against runaway climate change. Green urban spaces help cool our cities and protect us from storms. And this doesn't even account for the health and psychological and for some people, the spiritual benefits of spending time outdoors in places like Canada's renowned green belt that wraps around southern Ontario like a great green cloak, or places like Canada's newest urban national park, which is going to be right here in Markham in the Rouge National Urban Park on the east side of the GTA. These ecosystems provide these benefits. Scientists typically refer to them as natural capital. I want you to think about that. I'm going to be saying that word a lot because as decision makers, the counselors that are here, Typically, the challenge that they're faced with is how do we manage our social capital? How do we manage our economic capital? I want you to feel confident that you can start thinking about a third critical asset that Markham is blessed with, which is the natural capital resources that this community has uh, within its jurisdiction. As biological creatures, we depend on natural capital and the ecological services that it creates to sustain us. But the problem is, is that both natural capital and the benefits that we get from natural capital, like clean air, clean water, 
healthy food to eat, habitat for things like pollinators, which are critically important because they're involved in the production of about a third of the food that we eat every single day. These things are typically treated as externalities. They're ignored by decision makers, in part because our decision makers have such a poor idea of what these things are and what they are truly worth. But nevertheless, as biological creatures, we literally depend on these things for the health and well-being of our families. For example, here in the Golden Horseshoe, rapid population increases and the resulting urban expansion are placing unprecedented pressure on the natural capital assets of our region. It's leading to the loss and degradation of fertile agricultural areas, remnant forests, wetlands, as well as those critical ecological services that these ecosystems support. For example, things like pollinators, monarch butterflies, which I'm sure you're hearing a lot about uh, uh, on the media, in part because this is a flagship species. It's a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. How many of you remember having a monarch butterfly land on your hand when you were out playing with your friends in the schoolyard? Does anyone have that memory? Very few of us still have that memory or a recent memory or our children experience that. The last time I saw a monarch butterfly was probably about 15 years ago. And yet when I was growing up as a kid in Thornhill in the 1970s, these things were ubiquitous. In fact, they were effectively a, uh, a signal of our relationship with nature. It was such a beautiful reminder of our connection to the natural world. And yet species like monarch butterflies and other pollinators are plummeting. This is now a highly imperiled species. It's highly imperiled not just because of the fact that its uh, home in Mexico, in the mountains central of central Mexico, are being impacted by things like illegal logging or climate change, but it's also because of the fact that as these monarch butterflies return to places like Markham, there is less and less habitat for them to feed and to live on. Their primary source of habitat is milkweed. And yet we typically treat milkweed as a noxious weed, or we try to remove it from our farms or from our right-of-ways. Now, the significance of urbanization as a major form of land use was recently brought into sharp relief as a consequence of a series of remarkable maps that were published by a professor by the name of Dr. Timothy Golden at the University of Maryland Center for International and Security Studies. Some of you may have seen these maps. They first appeared uh, in the scientific literature, but then Timothy then published these maps uh, with Richard Florida, who's a well-known urbanist and thinker at the University of Toronto, in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine. What Timothy did here was use high-resolution satellite imagery to try to detect light emissions around the planet. So what you're seeing here is an aggregate of what our continent looks like at night. Everything from lit homes, powered factories, illuminated city streets, and largely urban infrastructure, which dominates much of the continent. Let's zoom in a little bit. This is now northeastern North America. The red arrow points to the GTA, and that area surrounding it, which is a little bit dimmer, is the green belt. Let's zoom in a little bit more. We now orient ourselves. This is southern Ontario, the greater uh, Golden Horseshoe region. You can see the green belt, which I've outlined in yellow, the Niagara Escarpment. What these maps show is that how much of our region is now under the direct influence of the human footprint. Timothy is essentially using light emissions as a surrogate for land use. But they also show that is a consequence of some sound urban planning, things like the growth plan and the greenbelt plan. These things are acting in concert to help contain urbanization and also protect those vital stocks of natural capital which have not yet been developed over. So in partnership with the Friends of the Greenbelt Foundation, the David Suzuki Foundation over the last decade has been trying to look at these natural capital assets of the Greenbelt and surrounding areas, including in Markham, and how these things are so vitally important in terms of sustaining human health and well-being. We've looked at everything from how natural capital helps to uh, prevent flooding. We've looked at the importance of natural capital in terms of uh, mitigating climate change as a major carbon store in southern Ontario. We've also looked at how urbanization 
is affecting natural capital as a consequence of land use and land use change. I want to share with you a few of our findings. This is generally a good news story. Now, at a time when natural capital has perhaps never been more at risk in much of southern Ontario as a consequence of growing urbanization as well as uh, infrastructure, things like proposed new highways, there's a proposed new international airport, which will be neighbor to you just to the east um, uh, of you in, in Pickering. I think it's important for us to take stock of what we have secured to date through policy in terms of protecting natural capital. And this is an image that is best perceived uh, from hundreds of kilometers above the surface of the earth using satellite imagery. So here are some satellite imagery uh, and maps that my lab at the University of Toronto and my staff at the Davis Suzuki Foundation have uh, produced. So satellite images of the Greenbelt, for example, which is one of the most important public policy responses to urbanization. This is 1.8 million acres in size. It's the world's largest protected greenbelt of forests, fields, farmland, and other stocks of natural capital on the planet. Um, it produces about $9 billion in uh, economic goods and services. That doesn't even account for the hundreds of millions of dollars in non-market ecosystem services that the Greenbelt produces as well, which I'll talk about in a second. But I want you to look at the Greenbelt here and the picture that we're getting uh, from this satellite imagery. Satellite images of the Greenbelt show how irreplaceable this uh, protected archipelago of green space and farmland is and how it's increasingly being surrounded by a relatively inhospitable landscape of human land use, primarily as a consequence of urbanization. In some cases, it's not the case here in Markham, but it is the case in some municipalities, urbanization and infrastructure threatens to consume the best of what's left of natural capital on the land base. About a third of the Greenbelt is still covered by natural forest, about a fifth by wetlands. So that's the areas in purple are wetlands, in green are natural forest. And while our research has shown that there's been very little loss of natural forest or wetland cover from in and around the Greenbelt, there has been a disproportionately high conversion of high value agriculture to lands, primarily to urban and built up areas over the last few decades. For example, 38% of the golden horseshoe is comprised of highly productive agricultural soils. These are classified as class one to class three agricultural soils. And yet more than half of, the, of all the urban development that has occurred in the GTHA over the last decade and a half has explicitly occurred on these class one soils. So here are some examples. Anything you see in red on these maps were areas that had previously been in a farmland as a land cover, class one farmland, which was then converted over to non-agricultural use. In most cases, it's urbanization. In some cases, it's aggregate development and other types of resource development. Uh, in fact, the loss of agricultural soils should concern all of us. Only 5% of Canada's entire land base is actually capable of growing food. At the same time, according to Statistics Canada, we have lost an astounding 4 million hectares of farmland in class one to class three. That's an area that is three times larger the size of Vancouver Island, seven times larger the size of Prince Edward Island. From 1971 to 2011, 4 million hectares of class one to three agricultural land has been developed, primarily for urbanization. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I can tell you that when I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, I and my classmates would go to the CN Tower. Maybe some of you guys did this trip as well. And you could go up to the observation deck on the CN Tower and you could turn northwards and you would try to find your house, right? Which, and my house was in Thornhill. I remember very vividly looking off into the horizon and seeing nothing but farmland north of Steeles. That's not the situation today, largely because of the consequence of how we have grown and managed our cities. But we are, at the same time, investing in good, sound public policy. Things like the growth plan, things like the green belt, 
things like the creation of Canada's first urban national park, which is going to secure about 67% of its footprint is currently in agriculture and will stay in agriculture under the governance of Parks Canada. I think that's actually a very innovative approach to how we think about protected areas in a landscape that is not intact. This is a landscape that has had a long history of human inhabitation, not just recently with the flood of immigrants like my own family that came to Canada in 1969, but going back hundreds of years with those early agricultural um, uh, settlers and even before that, 10,000 years of human uh, land use with our uh, Aboriginal peoples. In fact, almost half of Canada's urban land base today was, on, was being farmed only a few generations ago, and that includes places in Markham. For the most part, this land can no longer be used to produce food. Now, that's a very provocative statement, because I know that people, including decision makers here in Markham, are trying very hard to grow food in a highly urbanized geography. Everything from city gardens, community gardens, green roofs, and even people taking uh, responsibility in their own hands and doing things like guerrilla gardening. These are all great responses to growing concern around local food security in highly urbanized regions. Now, my lab at the University of Toronto at the Faculty of Forestry and at the Davis Suzuki Foundation, we have tried to look at these natural capital assets in a different way. We've tried to essentially look at these natural capital assets as core infrastructure assets for municipalities like Markham. And the way we've tried to do this is by trying to evaluate their economic contribution to local residents. And we've done this through something called natural capital valuation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I mentioned the fact that the Greenbelt has been estimated to provide about $9 billion in market goods and services. That was a study that was done by a colleague of mine at the University of McGill. What does that mean? Well, what that means is everything like fruits and vegetables, beef, pork, award-winning wines, and other agricultural commodities. You just look at, need to look at the rise in uh, uh, th the number of people that are now cycling uh, on these old uh, country lanes, uh, you know, riding bicycles that in some cases cost $5,000, $10,000. These are the Bay Street boys and girls, right? They go up to places like the Greenbelt on the weekend uh, to recreate. This is a direct subsidy of that green space back to the economy through things like uh, recreation. It's all very, very important. But our team at the Davis Suzuki Foundation has also been looking at the fact that communities like Markham or Toronto or Guelph or Brampton are literally sitting on a Fort Knox of natural capital assets over and above the market benefits that these types of land cover are providing. Woodlots, carbon-rich wetlands and bogs, and some of the most fertile agricultural land in all of the country. We estimated conservatively that fields, farmlands, forests, and other natural and managed ecosystems in the Greenbelt are providing some $2.6 billion annually, an average of $3,487 per hectare, through the cumulative contribution of ecosystem services. These are the net benefits that you're getting off that natural capital such as carbon sequestration and storage, recreation, pollination, and other benefits. In fact, the ecological economist that did our work, Sarah Wilson, even whimsically referred to bumblebees and other pollinators that she tracked in her economic models as flying $50 bills. Because literally, this is how much value these pollinators are providing as a direct subsidy to our agricultural economy. She estimated, again, very, very conservatively, that uh, pollination services in the greater Toronto uh, and Hamilton area provide some $250 million in pollination services per year. I want to tell you about my morning. Every morning since I was a kid, I have done the exact same thing. I get up, put a piece of toast in the toaster, out it pops out, and I slather almond butter on that piece of toast. I was one of the early shifters. I moved from peanut butter to almond butter. Now I'm told that almond butter is really good for you. It helps reduce the bad cholesterol. It helps improve the good cholesterol. It's good for regulating um, 
blood uh, sugar. It's a, a great source of healthy fats. There's lots of good reasons for a middle-aged man like myself to eat almond butter or any nut butters for that sense. But I've been watching how the price of almond butter has changed since the 1980s when I first started buying almond butter myself with my, my parents going to the local uh, grocery store. When I started to first buy almond butter and put it on my toast, a 500 milliliter jar of almond butter cost $5.99. I went to the Whole Foods just before here. Now I know it's an organic store, I know it has certain branding, and I know that, that's, that's all gonna be factored into the price. A jar of almond butter at Whole Foods today costs between $11.99 and $15.99 for a 500 milliliter jar of almond butter. Now the price in almond butter, that price, has increased for a bunch of reasons. One of them being that the popularity of that food stuff. But there's another reason. Do you know what that reason is? It's because the primary pollinator that pollinates the almond groves in California is completely disappearing. These pollinator populations are precipitously declining. They're declining as a consequence of a number of reasons. There's pesticide use. There's uh, other forms of land use that are converting areas where these pollinators would normally have foraged. There's the uh, concerns around climate change, the, the recent droughts that have been happening in uh, California. The, the result of that has been that almond production today is very different than almond production in the 1970s and the 1980s, where farmers could have relied on natural pollinators to provide a natural subsidy to the production of that commodity. Increasingly, farmers are going to have to rely on, and they're doing this already, purchasing pollination services by buying pollinators or renting pollinators, bringing them into their almond plantations or their blueberry fields uh, or, or any type of farm to replace that natural service that has since been degraded or has disappeared altogether. The cost of growing almonds and lots of other commodities is going up as a consequence of the loss of that natural ecosystem service. There's a bunch of other ecosystem services that are also disappearing. For example, one of the uh, big concerns that policymakers have is around atmospheric pollution and extreme heat, two major drivers that are associated with climate change. We are already seeing increasing visits in emergency rooms and as a consequence increasing healthcare costs as a result of the most vulnerable people in our communities not being able to breathe on a bad smog day. There's a lot of reasons why this is happening. Part of it is congestion. Part of it is because there's more cars on the road. But there is also really, really good data. Some of that data has been provided, produced by my lab at the University of Toronto and our colleagues looking that as we have actually reduced the canopy cover in our communities, we've seen an increase in the number of people that are suffering for some of these respiratory diseases. This is resulting in increased healthcare costs. A natural ecosystem service that our urban forests used to provide in terms of moderating and mitigating and regulating air pollution that is uh, essentially being degraded as a consequence of human land use. I want to continue. Now, there's a very interesting fellow by the name of Paul Hawken. Has anyone here read Paul Hawken? Paul Hawken is a very important writer, in part because he had the ear of major policymakers, in particular, Bill Clinton. Now, Paul Hawken wrote a series of books that Bill Clinton was, was reading when he was in, in office and developing public policy. And um, Clinton was very interested in Paul Hawking's work because Paul Hawking has a very interesting thesis behind his work. This is essentially what Paul has to say. Paul believes that while there is no truly right way to value a forest or a river or an estuary, there is a wrong way, which is to give it no value whatsoever when we make development decisions that can degrade or destroy those very things. Unfortunately, that's exactly what we typically do. As I mentioned earlier, most ecosystem services, like clean air or clean water or healthy popul pollinator populations, are treated ex externalities when we make development decisions. 
with the assumption that the loss and degradation of natural capital and those elements of ecosystem services will have no consequence to our economy or to the health and well-being of local residents. This is short-sighted. Simon Fraser University economist Dr. Nancy Olleweiler, who's one of my colleagues, has argued that protecting green space and farmland in places like the Greenbelt or Rouge Urban National Park actually results in cost savings for cash-strapped municipal governments. Because replacing those ecological services with engineered or manufactured substitutes like water filtration plants or retention walls can cost hundreds of millions of dollars, often for a lesser level of service than nature is able to provide for free. Paul has argued that there's actually a fiscal incentive for municipalities like Markham to protect and to restore natural capital because of the savings that we are likely to receive by maintaining a bare minimum balance of these critical ecological services that are otherwise too expensive or impossible to replace with manufactured infrastructure. Indeed, the fiscal rationale for protecting, restoring, and enhancing natural capital is nothing new. Many ambitious policy solutions have come about not because of the fact that leaders were necessarily trying to protect wildlife or biodiversity or were somehow inclined as environmentalists, although there are people like that, and some of them are here today, but because municipalities were actually trying to reduce costs for providing bare minimum services, especially things like stormwater. For example, all of you must remember the example of New York in the 1990s. New York City chose to protect its drinking watershed through land purchase, pollution control, and conservation easements at a cost of about $1.5 billion rather than building more gray infrastructure to do essentially the same things. Um, their decision to protect those stocks of natural capital uh, uh, was estimated that it would cost about five times the amount as an initial uh, investment, uh, plus 300 to 500 million dollars annually uh, to maintain. Looking back on those policy investments, scientists have now discovered that protecting the Catskill watershed is a natural filtration system, provides over 9 million New York citizens with about 1.1 billion gallons of clean drinking water at a fraction of a cost of what it would have otherwise cost if that city had not protected uh, those stocks of natural capital, and if those stocks had been otherwise uh, developed, and therefore those stormwater services and other types of services would have had to have been replaced with engineered solutions. Providing clean drinking water is a challenge for many Canadian cities. I don't know if it's a challenge here in Markham, but it's definitely a challenge in many Canadian cities, because so few of our communities draw our drinking water from pristine or protected watersheds. We have to rely on expensive treatment systems because the ecosystems from which this water is drawn from are degraded or otherwise are tainted with types of pollutions. Everything from uh, excess nitrogen in the systems or pesticides uh, or uh, pathological uh, um, uh, pathogens, biological pathogens which are um, associated with uh, human uh, land use. In comparison, I want to give you two very large communities that have chosen a different route. The cities of Victoria and Vancouver decided that they were going to invest in protecting their drinking watersheds. In Victoria, it's the Souk Hills. In Vancouver, it's the North Shore Mountains. These mature forests, in many cases, these are old growth forests. They filter, they store, they regulate the region's drinking water at a marginal cost to taxpayers. They provide this beneficial natural service that complements engineered solutions as well, which are very expensive to build and to maintain. Now, I want to stress that these estimates of the replacement costs of natural capital and the ecosystem services are one fraction of the true value of nature in terms of sustaining life on our planet. You cannot put a price on the services that we receive from nature like the spiritual services that many people get from spending time outdoors. This is something that our indigenous brothers and sisters are trying to communicate to us around the value of nature in terms of its, its strings value to us in terms of our health and well-being. 
nature is truly sacred. But I want to return to those remarkable satellite maps that I showed earlier that were done by Timothy Golden. They reveal something that is quite remarkable and I think kind of goes at the heart of what Canadians think about ourselves. Despite being a vast nation of mountains, of forests and ice, we are truly an urban society. The fact is 82% of us live in large urban areas. In fact, if you look at the statistics of habitation that have been collated by the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Canada ranks in the top 50 urbanized nations on the planet. We are more urbanized relatively than United Kingdom, Germany, Ireland, Italy, and most other Western European countries. In fact, over half of our GDP every year is produced in just five cities alone. Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa, though cities like Markham are also economic powerhouses in their own right. So the reality is, is that while some cities are experiencing unbelievable boom in growth and expansion in terms of their economic contribution to our society, and Markham is one of them, the reality is that maintaining the infrastructure to sustain this growth is a challenge. Just last year, I heard the most remarkable statistic, which is that the city of Toronto is now the most fourth most populous city in North America. We quietly slipped past uh, edged out Chicago, and we're just behind now, not just, but we're be behind uh, Mexico City, New York, and LA. We are the fourth largest, most, fourth most populous uh, urban region on the continent. So the question is, Public investment in urban infrastructure, is it being sustained to meet this growth? And you know about that you know, in, intuitively. It's everything from sewage and solid waste management, any pro energy production and distribution, transit and other built structures and technologies. According to the uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities and lots of experts, and many of them are in the room here today, Canada is lagging when it comes to meeting the infrastructure challenges to sustain this growth. But there are exceptions. I just uh, had a chance to look at your uh, uh, bus rapid transit system earlier this uh, afternoon. That's a very good investment in transit infrastructure uh, that is going to be of critical asset to your community as you manage your growth. But I want to give you a quote from a recent report by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, which explains the infrastructure deficit in a very visceral way. And that's really important because most Canadians are not experts when it comes to things like how do we plan our cities? How do we manage our infrastructure stocks? This is what the CCPA had to say. Quote, the evidence is clear both in the statistics and in the everyday experience of Canadians in every part of this country. It's clear in spine jarring streets and highways, mind numbing and catastrophically wasteful traffic jams in the struggles of rapidly growing communities to keep up with the needs for the basic nuts and bolts of maintaining urban civilization on this continent. It's pretty strong words. The CCPA study has shown that governments typically respond to the infrastructure deficit during times of crisis. We spend billions of dollars as part of economic stimulus packages. We did that coming out of the last recession in 2008 when we had federal investment in things like the construction industry as a way of stimulating uh, the economy. Sometimes it's a response to tragedy. For example, crumbling expressways in Montreal or here in Toronto. I don't think anyone has died here in Toronto, but people have died in Montreal because expressways have actually collapsed. Sewage floods and where you have angry ratepayers that are knocking on your door uh, uh, because they're very upset. They've, they've lost something that's very precious to them. Uh, which is their home. But I want you to think about infrastructure in a different way. Because there is a less obvious and as important um, stock of infrastructure, which is also as critically important to sustaining the health and well-being of our communities. And we have the same problem. We have an infrastructure asset, infrastructure deficit there, and that is natural capital. Things like urban forests and wetlands, local parks, healthy waterways, beaches, and engineered ecosystems, which have received comparatively little political attention from our governments, very little 
government funding, and yet they are so important in terms of sustaining a number of critical services that ratepayers expect. I use that term infrastructure deficit to apply to natural capital for a good reason. I'll give you an example. According to Environment Canada, the bare minimum forest canopy cover that a municipality should have is 30%. There is very, very few municipalities that come anywhere close to meeting that canopy coverage. Uh, and Environment Canada believes that based on a whole bunch of uh, ecosystem services that forest canopy provides, like uh, dealing with stormwater. I don't know what the canopy cover is in Markham is. Maybe somebody uh, can tell me. But there's no question about it. There's a deficit when it comes to canopy cover in highly urbanized regions of this country. So I want you to think about that as a deficit that also needs to be addressed in terms of infrastructure investments. And Yvonne told me a very uh, uh, inspired uh, policy here in the city of Markham, which is to plant you know, hundreds of thousands of trees uh, so that we can bring back the forest canopy cover that was found in Markham at the time of European settlement. It's going to provide enormous benefits to the local residents. And then there's no question about it. It's also going to ameliorate some of the infrastructure costs the city currently bears. The value of natural capital and other elements of green infrastructure have been brought into sharp relief recently in a series of quite dramatic events that have happened in the GTA and surrounding communities like uh, Markham. I want you to think of those terrible storms that hit the GTA uh, two years ago. Uh, there was a terrible uh, thunderstorm that just happened a couple of days ago. There was massive, massive flooding that happened in the city of Toronto again. Do you remember this storm that happened in June two years ago? It was remarkable. This photograph is remarkable. This is, uh, uh, I, can't, I, I don't know which street this is, this is on, but, but this happened on the Don Valley Parkway. It happened on the Gardner. It happened in lots of streets. 90 millimeters of rainfall, more than a month's worth, fell in less than two hours, just as everyone was returning back home after a very long work day. I'm sure you recall the dramatic photographs uh, in the media and in social media, uh, on the evening news, things such as manhole covers being propelled uh, skyward by geysers of sewage and stormwater, uh, cars, buses, and trains submerged and abandoned, and the sudden transformation of dog parks into lakes. This is the dog park by my house. And uh, I, you know, my kids wanted to jump in there and start swimming, and I had to remind them that it's a dog park, right? There's, <laughs> there's dog mess in there, and, and there's no question about it. I mean, you know, this was a threat uh, to, uh, to people because of higher counts of E. coli, and some people did have rashes and other types of, uh, of responses to the fact that there's a, there was a lot of uh, biological waste that was mixing in with these floodwaters. I want you to think about this, and I'm going to, as I begin to wind down here, because this is something that I think Markham must take into consideration as it begins to plan for what this city is going to look like under climate change. We already know climate change is happening, but these storms, the frequency, the intensity, the severity, are going to be much, much consequential for Markham in the coming decades. And we need to start planning for our communities to be able to cope and withstand for these types of challenges. These recurring flooding events, they are a reminder, they're an unsettling reminder of the vulnerability of our communities to the one-two punch of both climate change and aging infrastructure. For example, according to the Insurance Bureau of Canada, flooding in cities is now the leading cause of home insurance claims, surpassing fire damage. The National Roundtable on Environment and Economy has concluded that the annual costs of flooding due to climate change will total about $17 billion a year by 2050. Already, people that live in flood-prone areas, in leafy neighborhoods like Kitsilano in Vancouver, or where I live in the beaches, are seeing their monthly insurance premiums increase. Or in some cases, they're getting dumped <laughs> off their insurance policies. As insurance companies grapple with the fact that climate change is a direct threat to their bottom line. My home insurance policy has gone through the roof in the two years since the major storms that happened in the GTA, because I happen to live in an extremely flood-prone area of uh, the eastern beaches. Some of our neighbors have actually lost their insurance policies altogether because they're just too high a risk. And uh, this is a reality. 
It's not just urban centers that are facing uh, challenges with dealing with storms and floods when it comes to aving, aging infrastructure. According to the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority, the TRCA, they did a brilliant study that found that there are 42 areas in the GTA that are vulnerable to serious flooding in times of extreme rainfall, including many historic village cores that were originally established along river uh, corridors. Now, I'm gonna just touch on policy and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Though provinces and municipalities have programs to place to assist communities in recovering from extreme weather, for example, here in Markham, I'm sure you know that there is a uh, provincial program called the Ontario Disaster Relief Assistance Program, or ODRAP, uh, there is growing recognition that we have to make our communities much more resilient to the effects of climate change in the first place. This includes adopting policies and settling, setting funding priorities to facilitate the uptake of infrastructure, firstly, that can withstand the impacts of climate change, and secondly, that can help actually reduce our vulnerability to extreme weather events like flash flooding and extreme heat days. And the idea is very timely. Following the crippling ice storm in the GTA, the mayor of Markham, along with all of the mayors in the GTA, as well as a number of regional chairs, passed a unanimous resolution to ask the province of Ontario for $190 million in emergency funding to deal with the ice storm. This was under the leadership of Mississauga mayor at the time, Hazel McCallion. And they got the money. Right? Ministry, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing has approved $190 million in uh, extreme uh, emergency funding to help municipalities like Markham uh, you know, deal with the cost of the ice storm. But I want you to pay attention to another resolution that was also passed by these 19 mayors and GTA chairs that got no political attention whatsoever. This was the third resolution that got passed unanimously uh, including by the city of Markham. It says specifically, we're not just asking for money. Essentially, this is what this resolution was saying. We're not just it's imagining that the province of Ontario is going to be the uh, ATM machine for the municipalities when it comes to dealing with climate change. That would be irresponsible. This is what the municipalities had to say. Quote, the provincial and federal governments must establish new programs and expand existing programs to address disaster mitigation that would include forestry, erosion control, winter storms, tree canopy, and other severe storm events that reflect the reality of climate change. This will include funding for rehabilitation of municipal infrastructure to mitigate this and future environmental and storm event impacts. This is very forward-thinking policy. Interest in investing in infrastructure to reduce the vulnerability of our communities to extreme weather is growing rapidly elsewhere as well. For example, after Hurricane Sandy, the US Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, began to shift billions of dollars in expenditures into securing, protecting, and enhancing the green infrastructure um, stocks of communities as a response to this massive hurricane. The city of Philadelphia is now spending $1.6 billion to convert a third of its impervious asphalt service to absorptive green spaces in major storm water projects. Closer to home, some of you may have seen this, this is a beautiful project, Toronto's new Corktown Common in the West Donlands at the foot of the DVP. It combines recreational uses with flood control features, including a system of engineered ecosystems designed to help manage storm water on site. This and other design features on the site are examples of a very effective uh, strategy for dealing with extreme storm water events. I'm going to finish with an example of what the city of Markham can do that, you know, it could include, and there may be projects like this that are happening in Markham, and I'd love to visit them if they are uh, uh, already in place or they're being planned, but I want to talk about local residents before I end, because it's an hour and you guys need to eat. So, the reality is that most of our neighborhoods in places where I live in Toronto, like the Financial District or the Humber Summit or the Junction, um, they're entirely covered with asphalt and pavement. During a big rainstorm, these impermeable uh, surfaces of concrete and asphalt dramatically accelerate runoff volume, speeding towards waterways and low-lying areas, and ultimately into our lakes and our rivers. But you guys know natural ecosystems don't work this way. Forests, fields, marshes, and wetlands, they absorb rainfall, they slow water flowing through vegetation and soils. So incorporating natural vegetation into our built environment 
mitigates the intensity of storm surges. Green landscapes can also help cool neighborhoods during extreme storm heat waves. So interventions that bring together the natural and the built environment is the way of the future. It ranges from large networks of interconnected green space like the Greenbelt, uh, as well as the uh, Rouge National Urban Park, to small scaled engineered systems like green roofs, permeable pavement, and green walls. But despite this opportunity, Canada's, uh, Ontario's former environmental commissioner, Gord Miller, had a scathing assessment of the policy response. He says, we are punching below our weight class when it comes to having policies and programs in place to address infrastructure like landscape and gray infrastructure, as well as promoting building green. For example, green infrastructure solutions, which have been emphasized in climate adaptation strategies in Europe and the US, they completely remain outside the policy lexicon in most of Ontario. And as a consequence, we're failing to recognize or harness the vital ecological services that these green spaces can provide, such as green roofs and bioswales. Again, as you know, these things complement grey infrastructure. Now, I want to talk to you about the fact that it's not just the people in this room. It's not just the decision makers. It's not just the designers, the architects, the landscape designers that can help bring green to the city. It's our local residents. Most of the green space in our communities is not owned by provincial or federal or municipal governments. It's privately owned. In Toronto, I hear it's something like 60%. It's the front yards, it's the backyards. So what can we do to encourage local residents to start thinking about managing their own footprint in a way that would radically increase the stock of natural capital in our communities? So in Vancouver, there's a new program uh, to encourage residents to train uh, gray alleyways into engineered gray country, green country lanes. And I want to talk to you about a very innovative project that the Davis Suzuki Foundation is doing in the west side of Toronto that we're hoping to bring to Markham by working with people like Yvonne Young and uh, the planning community here in Markham. Uh, we cheekily call this project the Homegrown National Park Project. And for a, for a time there, I had to actually uh, deal with very angry federal bureaucrats that said, you know, Faisal, you can't just declare the west side of Toronto a national park. And I said, well, no, hold on a second. Let's think about crowdsourcing a national park through interventions that all of us can do at a very small scale, and it's the aggregate cumulative contribution of these interventions that are effectively going to create a canopy of green space across the west side of the city. So we have a project called the Homegrown National Park, and our goal is to crowdsource a green corridor along the old Garrison Creek uh, in the west side of Toronto. It is four, sorry, five uh, wards on the uh, west side of Toronto. Now, this is an area that used to be Garrison Creek. This is what Garrison Creek looked like in 1907. Uh, it was a ravine system with a beautiful, mature forest. This is what Garrison Creek looks like today. That creek was diverted uh, underground, and homes and factories and businesses have now been built on top of it. Our goal is to help catalyze a movement whereby local residents can help green that corridor, the Garrison Corridor, one household, block, and neighborhood at a time to help reduce the vulnerability that local residents have to things like extreme flooding by increasing the amount of green infrastructure that is found within that corridor. The fact is that if devastating storms are the new norm, then we need to build green infrastructure and we need to build green. So to conclude, we must remember that nature is our home. Nature provides our most fundamental needs and dictates our limits to growth. If we are striving to create a truly sustainable region, we need to do everything in our power to protect the natural capital riches that we are blessed with, the fields, the farms, the forests, that are not only important to the market economy, but also are important to the non-market economy by sustaining the life support systems of our communities. Let's hope that our political readers recognize this historic opportunity and demonstrate the courage and foresight to embark on a visionary new path to literally bring nature home 
back to our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Just a housekeeping item. It's one o'clock. I know this lecture was only supposed to go to one o'clock. So uh, would people like to stay for a Q&A uh, or do you have to get back? Uh, let me know. My, my apologies. I shouldn't have gone over. Um, any Q&A, any burning questions from anybody? Yep. I'll do a quick one. Sure. Yeah. So I would do two things. I would encourage the city of Markham to take that third resolution that they passed along with the other 19 GTA mayors and go back to the province with that. Don't just ask the province for money after an extreme event happens. Start working with the province to create programs and policies to help you integrate gray infra green infrastructure into your policies and programs. And then the other one is work with NGOs like the TRCA or the Davis Suzuki Foundation or Evergreen to do something like this. Choose a neighborhood, maybe it's German Mills, uh, maybe it's one of your newer communities, to actually try to start greening the community through a crowdsourcing strategy. Well, I had a very similar mm -hmm. by the wayside for either like tunnels along Lake Hero Boulevard. Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe now is a better time to reestablish the yeah. older ideas that yeah. mm -hmm. probably cheaper in the long run with mm -hmm. some of the facts that you might have yeah. might help to sell uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in closing I'd like to thank Dr. Mula for such an inspiring talk. Uh, we thank again uh, the Public Realm Strategy Group in the city of Markham for uh, looking after this presentation. We'd also like to thank uh, the David Suzuki Foundation, OPPI, and OALA for making this event possible. Um, as far as the OPPI goes, um, I hope you plan to attend the 2015 OPPI conference in Toronto. If not, I would like to note that the 2016 OPPI symposium will be held in Hamilton and the topic is healthy communities and planning the public realm. So that's a really good one for all of us to engage in. Um, anybody who's listening out there, see you in Hamilton. You're also welcome to join us here in Markham uh, in the fall for our next talk in, as part of our speaker series. And this one's called Animating the Public Realm by, by the group called 8 to 80 Cities. All our lectures are eligible for OALA and OPPI professional credits. If you have not already done so, please sign it at the Great Hall. There's also a light lunch out there for your enjoyment. To go with the theme, all the food here is made from locally sourced ingredients. Thank you and see you again in the fall. And before I stop, I should introduce uh, David from Pan Am, from the Pan Am team who's gonna say a few words. Hi everyone. I I believe you're hungry, so I'll try to keep this short and very sweet. Talking of, of infrastructure, and in this case, finding infrastructure, we have a lot of things happening in Markham. I don't know if you've seen our beautiful building, uh, the Pan Am Center, where we, we're, we're going to be hosting four different uh, sport events for the Pan Am Games and Para Pan Am Games this summer. And we also have uh, Angus Glen Golf Course, where we're, where we're having golf for the first time introducing the Pan Am Games. Uh, besides the sports, we have a lot more happening in Markham. Uh, we have Torch Relay full day event this Saturday, a lot of free activities across the entire city. Uh, we also have a street festival happening for nine days during the Markham Global Fest, as well as uh, two social media campaigns. I challenge all of you to take a fan photo with your family, your friends, hashtag it Markham uh, It will be printed into a collage that will go into the, to the Pan Am Center, which I think is a really cool community uh, art project. And also, if you find Apache, take a photo with Apache, 
mark on patchy and then you can win a prize there's an ipad and there will be other prizes so i don't want to take too much of your time i'll stick around for a few minutes if you have any questions about panama i'm more than happy to to help you thank you before we stop can we have a round of applause for dr uh, faisal Miller? thank you very much dr Muller. If anybody has any questions, please come and see Dr. Muller directly. He'll be available to answer any of your questions. Thank you.